My name is Lexia Sassoni. I am a double major in chemistry and earth and environmental science. Um, and I will be presenting on my project, Spectroscopic Analysis of the PC645 Light Harvesting System in Algae. So to start, I'd like to thank um, my advisor, Professor David Coker and Nav Kumar, for helping me throughout this project. So my research project was a computational chemistry research project, and this differs from a lot of other chemistry you may be thinking of. So instead of using beakers and Bunsen burners, we actually use computers to model chemical systems. And so the objective of my specific research project was to better utilize solar energy with a down converter. So what a down converter does is it takes something of higher energy and it converts it into something of lower, more usable form of energy. And so these naturally occur in nature, in things like photosynthetic um, organisms. And so um, some of you may be familiar with chlorophyll. It's a key component of the photosynthetic process. Um, it's what gives things like plants its green color, and it helps to convert the incoming light energy into a more usable form of energy for the photosynthetic organism. Now the problem with chlorophyll is that it has a very narrow absorption range. So it's only actually able to use red light. And you can see how this would be a problem for organisms that live in environments where the uh, spectrum of light is very variable. And so what a lot of organisms have been able to do is they have um, adapted down converter systems. So they're able to take, say, higher energy blue light, down convert that into the red light that then the chlorophyll can use. And so the strategy of this research project was to understand the efficient processes of energy transfer that exist in nature. The ultimate goal of this research is to extend the photovoltaic range of silicon and other materials. So similar to chlorophyll, silicon and photovoltaic materials have very narrow absorption ranges. And so we hope with this research we can um, learn a little bit more about how we could expand that. So for my research topic, I used a computational model to investigate a complex commonly found in algae, the PC645 system, which is shown right here. Um, and we looked at this as an example of a highly efficient light harvesting complex. And so what we did was, through our modeling, we made small changes to the system, and we looked at the effects that this had in the energy transfer process. And so hopefully throughout this talk, I can um, help you better understand what this computational modeling looks like, uh, what these small changes we're making to the system are, and how this affects the energy transfer process and what that looks like. So to do this, I'll first begin by introducing the PC645 system in more detail. I'll then give a little bit of background on the modeling process itself. And then I'll go into some of these results. And I do want to preface by saying the results and the figures that I'll be showing are from a research paper on this topic. But since producing this slide deck, we've actually been able to replicate these results, which has been really exciting. OK, so this is the PC645 system. It looks really complicated. Um, but basically, the grayed out part, that's the protein. So that's the bulk of the system, and then you also have these colored components, which are the chromophores, and this is what actually interacts with the light. And so specifically in my research, I want to focus in on the MBV chromophores. So this is a zoomed in picture, and there's actually two different versions of the MBV chromophore that we looked at. And so the difference is very small. It's this little white part here, which is a hydrogen. And so basically, the sh they only differ in either the addition of a hydrogen in the HPC645 system or the removal of a hydrogen in the PC645 system. Um, and so both of these actually occur naturally in nature. So these systems are surrounded by water. And whether that water acts as a hydrogen donor or acceptor, you can get both versions of these systems occurring. And so the um, good thing about modeling is we can just basically tell the computer, add or remove a hydrogen. So the first step in this modeling process is molecular dynamics. Molecular dynamics is a method that we use to analyze the physical movements of atoms and molecules in a system. And so if I can play a short clip here, you can see that um, this system is dynamic, it's not static. And so in order to gain an accurate representation of the system, we have to sample a bunch of different conformational fluctuations. 
The next step is the quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics is a theory that describes the physical properties at the scale of atoms. And so we wanted to calculate different properties to look at the excitation energy transfer process. And so I'll go a little bit deeper into what that looks like. So here we have the PC645 system. Um, and we know it exists in nature. It's exposed to light. So what can happen is a light can come in and interact with the system. And if that light is at the right energy, what we call the excitation energy, it can go in and excite a chromophore. This chromophore can then relax and excite another chromophore. And so you can see that energy moves to the system. And as it does, it dissipates some of this energy and down converts it to a lower form of energy. And so I think it's important to note the time scale. This is a very rapid process. It happens at the femtosecond scale, so 10 to the negative 15 seconds, whereas the um, molecular dynamics video that I showed in the previous slide, that's occurring at the nanosecond scale, so 10 to the negative 9 seconds. So to go into some of the results, so what you're looking at here is a comparison between the two different systems. Again, the HPC645 system having that hydrogen, the PC645 system without the hydrogen. And so what you're looking at are site energies. And so these um, different site energies correspond to like what um, energy of incoming light that they will interact with. And so the important thing to note here is the change that we see in that MVV chromophore. So you can see just by simply making a small change, removing that hydrogen, you can see um, significant effects in the energy transfer process. You actually see an increase in its excitation energy. Um, we can look at this in another way. So here on the x-axis, you're looking at energy. On the y-axis, you're looking at the absorption of that light. And so again, I want to point out that just by making a small change, we got a huge effect in the excitation energy transfer process. You can see by removing that hydrogen, you actually get an increase in the amount of energy that is absorbed at higher energies. And so just to wrap up, um, there's definitely still a lot of analysis that needs to be done on this specific um, system. But we would also love to study similar systems to see how other down converters and other photosynthetic organisms work as well. And all of this is to ultimately gain the ability to down convert energy, um, hopefully to better utilize light with higher energy. Um, and yeah, to ultimately more efficiently capture solar energy. And that is my presentation. Thank you. Yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, like, feel free to be super short in answering this if yeah. like, this is too technical. But um, so I did some research last summer in math, and I was doing billiard dynamics, which we were modeling the behavior of billiard balls on these sort of abstract surfaces. And it was very much spatial and geometric. And I was wondering how much of your computational modeling was like probabilistic, because you mentioned quantum mechanics, and I know there's a lot of probability modeling involved in that. And how much of that was like spatial and geometric, where you're modeling the positions of things, or was it both? Yeah, so a lot of the first stage was very much based on the geometry. So kind of the how close things are to each other and how they're oriented to each other changes a lot of their kind of um, interactions. And so it'll change like the forces that they experience and like um, whether these chromophores are close or far apart, they're able to couple differently. And so I think the spatially was much more of um, kind of a factor than the, the probabilistic side of it. Yeah. Um, everything looks so smooth and like just clear in your presentation of this, but I'm curious if there were if there was a particular moment that was more difficult or more surprising in the process, something that happened that you weren't expecting? Yeah, so prior to this research, I had coding experience, but I'd never worked on kind of the supercomputer, which is where we did a lot of these calculations because they are so computationally intensive. Um, and so these jobs, like just calculating the force of one chromophore that it experiences, that takes a couple of days to run. And so you could submit a code, it'll take a couple of days, and then you don't get that feedback until later. And if you made any kind of coding error, well, then you have to go and reiterate that. And so I think the process was the most surprising to me, because uh, you read papers, and it, you see these results, and they, they make sense, but you don't actually get to see the process behind it. Were there any results that you found surprising or like that you really 
glad you discovered during the process? Yeah, so initially I wasn't as sure about how the environment that these exist in actually had such a large influence. So if I go back to my slide, um, you can see that these exist in the presence of things like water and things like proteins. Well, proteins have acidic components to them. And so I actually was able to do some calculations. And so these MBV chromophores specifically have stronger interactions with the water, whereas kind of these other chromophores, they interact more strongly with the protein. And so that's why we're able to see these two different versions of the MBV exist in nature. Just kind of large scale question yeah. in the future. How, um, you know, was there a, is there a lot of data and how, how, how well are we doing with getting solar more out there and, and more used? And how, you know, how do you, how far do you think we have to in go? In terms of down converters or just, solar energy in general? Just, I mean, solar energy in general. Is there, are yeah. there a lot of studies going on? Yeah, I would say so. I think that's like one of the most rapidly growing forms of renewable energy, I would say. I think um, especially here in Massachusetts, there's been a lot of kind of back and forth between coastal and like versus like, I don't know, in terms of businesses going to solar versus individuals going to solar. I think I've seen a lot more movement on the individual side of people actually implementing that on their individual households. I think I've seen less in terms of businesses, but there's definitely a great deal of research. I know for down converters specifically, um, there's been a lot of kind of experimental, like in lab work looking at these systems. And so we're kind of just in that phase where we're moving from experiment to modeling. But yeah, there's definitely growth there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.